Filmmakers thought the fans would never notice, but they were wrong. These are the sequels that ignored major cliffhangers. The most significant cultural impact of the very long Friday the 13th film series is that it made homicidal maniac Jason Voorhees an iconic character. He's certainly intriguing and mysterious, and he kills with total fervor. Concealing his identity behind a creepy hockey mask, Jason looms so large that it's easy to forget that he's not the chief villain of every Friday the 13th movie. For example, his mother avenges his death in 1980's Friday the 13th, and he doesn't begin his killing spree until 1981's Friday the 13th Part 2. With this leading title and twist ending, 1985's Friday the 13th A New Beginning sets up its own franchise for a soft reboot. In this, the fifth Friday the 13th movie, Jason's original killer Tommy Jarvis remains haunted by the murder. But when a Jason imposter hunts Tommy to avenge the death of his son, Tommy defeats the killer and takes on the identity and mask of Jason Voorhees. This means that in the next movie, Friday the 13th Part 6, Jason Lives, Tommy as Jason is a central villain, right? Nope. The 1986 sequel begins with Tommy, who's played by a different actor, digging up Jason's corpse to burn it. Unfortunately, he accidentally resurrects the killer. And with that, Jason lives to strike again. Slasher movies thrive on jump scares and sudden twists. And since I Know What You Did Last Summer was something of a next-generation homage to slasher flicks, the 1997 horror film made good on the promise of shocking and unexpected deaths. One of them comes at the tail end of the movie, when a character played by the most famous person at the time seemingly dies in a grisly fashion. He's just out there and he's watching us and waiting. What are you waiting for, huh? What are you waiting for? The entire movie is about four teenagers who spend a year attempting to evade death by revenge from a raincoat-wearing stranger they unintentionally killed in a traffic accident. As I Know What You Did Last Summer reaches its conclusion, it seems like Julie James, played by Jennifer Love Hewitt, is in the clear. She's left home and is attending college in Boston. But when she heads into the shower one day, she sees I Still Know written in the steam on the shower door. Her unavenged victim-slash-killer shows up suddenly. Julie screams, and the movie ends. At that point, viewers can assume the raincoat man kills Judy quickly and efficiently. But the 1998 sequel, I Still Know What You Did Last Summer, begs to differ. Judy is the main character in the movie. She apparently didn't die or even fight off her attacker, because the film makes no mention of the final horrifying moments of the first film. While 2015's Ant-Man is more comedic and absurd than a typical Marvel Cinematic Universe entry, the film's stakes remain very high. Dr. Hank Pym, played by Michael Douglas, develops a suit that can shrink a human. After he's kicked out of his company by his one-time protege, he recruits Scott Lang, played by Paul Rudd, to stop that villain from figuring out the same tech and using it to carry out unfathomable acts of evil. The whole point of Ant-Man, then, is to stop the all-important tech from getting into the wrong hands. But it does. A Hydra agent named Mitchell Carson flees Pym Technologies with some yellow jacket particles and runs off to parts unknown. Where does he go, and how does he use Yellow Jacket Particles to advance his own agenda? Audiences never find out because neither of the sequels, Ant-Man and the Wasp, nor Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, follow up on Carson. When confronted with this lack of plot development, Ant-Man director Peyton Reed explained the unresolved cliffhanger. He told CinemaBlend, There was a sequence where Ant-Man has an encounter with him, but then, for a couple reasons, I felt like maybe we should leave those particles out there. The Marvel Cinematic Universe is a perpetually complicated and intricate network of films, with each entry directly connecting to so many others. That's how Marvel Studios keeps audiences coming back for more. We have to know what happens next, particularly after the post credit sequences. After the credits and mid credits scenes rolled in the 2016 MCU movie Doctor Strange, viewers who stayed in their seats caught one more sequence. It centers on Mordo, a supporting character who trains Dr. Stephen Strange in the use and history of magic. The after credit scene really seems to set up Mordo, who's portrayed by Academy Award-nominated actor Chiwetel Ejiofor for a solo movie, Disney Plus series, or significant plot arc in a future film. In the sequence, Mordo discusses the overabundance of sorcerers on the planet with fellow magical one Jonathan Pangborn. As such, Mordo presumably heads out to knock off some wicked wizards, but viewers never see that happen. Not even as a multiverse possibility in Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. In fact, he's barely in that movie. In 1999, Sony bought the rights to make movies based on characters in the Spider-Man universe, and later produced a Spider-Man trilogy. After its rivals at Marvel Studios started up the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Sony ramped up to stay competitive, rebooting the franchise with The Amazing Spider-Man in 2012 and The Amazing Spider-Man 2 in 2014. 
Sony has since released a couple of Venom films, three more Spider-Man movies, and Morbius. But the company never made a project featuring the Sinister Six, a team-up of the biggest, baddest, and most famous villains from the decades-old property. Among the antagonists, Dr. Octopus, Electro, Mysterio, Sandman, Vulture, and Kraven the Hunter. But it looked like Sony had a Sinister Six movie in the works around 2014, which it later confirmed, according to Deadline. A sequence in The Amazing Spider-Man 2 offers a quick glimpse of costume and prop elements of Sinister Six members, such as Vulture's wings and Dr. Octopus's tentacles, and the Green Goblin's glider, among other teasers. While some of those villains turn up in later Spider-Man movies, starting with the MCU-based Spider-Man Homecoming, the Sinister Six movie that was so blatantly promised never came to fruition. In Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides, rakish and roguish pirate captain Jack Sparrow finally seems to have met both his romantic and adversarial match in Angelica, played by Penelope Cruz. She's a pirate as crafty and daring as Captain Jack, and she claims to be the daughter of the legendary Blackbeard. Oscar winner Cruz came on board the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise nearly a decade in and injected new energy into it, but on Stranger Tides would mark her and Angelica's one and only appearance in the series. Growing weary of Angelica's machinations and unwilling to trust her, Jack abandons her on a tiny island before returning to his life of independent piracy and heading off to find his lost ship. That's how the movie ends, but a post credit scene shows audiences what happens next. A voodoo doll that looks like Captain Jack washes up on Angelica's island, and it's evident she plans to use the darkly magical object to exact revenge on him. Jack Sparrow dealing with a voodoo curse should have been a big part of the plot of 2017's Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales. But it isn't. Angelica doesn't even show up in that sequel. Prometheus, a prequel to the Alien series, is slow, cerebral, and requires intense concentration from audiences. Ridley Scott, who directed the initial Alien in 1979, helms a 2012 movie, which purported to set up the events that led to those other blockbusters. In the film, two scientists lead a deep space expedition to explore humanity's possible extraterrestrial origins. And just like in the other Alien movies, there's a lot of foreboding, death, and destruction. Prometheus winds up with optimistic, spiritual scientist Elizabeth Shaw as the only human survivor on her ship, along with an android named David. At the end of the film, Shaw and David seek out the home planet of the menacing engineers to discover why they wanted to exterminate all humans. A sequel to Prometheus, Alien Covenant hit theaters in 2017. Shaw only briefly appears as a corpse experimented on by David, who also destroyed the evil alien threat from the first movie. Shaw and David's interactions with the engineers are not discussed, and so their motivations remain a mystery. The 2000s action movie franchise XXX positioned itself as an edgier James Bond series for a new generation. Vin Diesel stars as Xander XXX Cage, an extreme sports athlete who cheats death as a matter of course and is recruited by the NSA to be a top spy. Unlike the ongoing Bond franchise, which is primarily a string of self-contained movies, the three XXX films will follow a sequence of events. That makes a filmmaker's decision to ignore some cliffhangers very confusing to viewers. At the end of 2002's XXX, Xander Cage completes his mission and is enjoying some well-earned rest and relaxation when handlers approach him with his next big spy assignment. As the film ends, it's unclear if he's going to accept the job, and nobody ever finds out because Diesel didn't want to return the 2005's Triple X State of the Union. The story goes that Xander Cage died off screen, while Ice Cube plays a new agent named Darius Stone, but then Diesel returned in 2017 for the third film, Triple X Return of Xander Cage, meaning the character never really died after all. Since launching in 1996, the Mission Impossible franchise has become one of the most successful action series of the past 30 years. 2011 saw the fourth entry of the franchise arrive in theaters, titled Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol. It introduced a new team of IMF agents who are working with Ethan Hunt to try to clear their names after they are accused of planting a bomb in the Kremlin. These fresh additions to the series included Jeremy Renner's intelligence analyst William Brandt, Simon Pegg's field agent Benji Dunn, and Paula Patton's agent Jane Carter. After they are successful in their mission, Hunt gathers everyone together again at the end of the film and hands them another one implying that this group will continue to work together as a new terrorist organization emerges. Unfortunately, fans never got to see any more of Carter despite the fact that other characters from the film reappeared in subsequent releases. With little mention of her, it is unclear where she is or what might have happened. Carter was seemingly set to return to the franchise, with rumors suggesting that she would have appeared in Rogue Nation, but scheduling conflicts meant her character was cut from the film. 
Before the Marvel Cinematic Universe became the juggernaut it is, Marvel Comics fans had the X-Men series to keep them occupied. Beginning with the first movie in 2000, the franchise ballooned to more than a dozen films. 2006 saw the release of the third movie in the series, X-Men The Last Stand. It follows Magneto and his brotherhood of mutants as they attempt to prevent a cure for the mutant gene from being forcefully imposed on mutant kind. It also features Jean Grey unleashing the Phoenix Force, ultimately killing Professor Charles Xavier and allying with Magneto. The movie ends with a post credit scene where a coma patient in a hospital wakes up and talks with the voice of Charles Xavier. This suggests that Professor X has somehow survived by placing his mind into the body of another person. But Charles Xavier, played by Patrick Stewart, returns in three sequel films. He first makes a cameo in the 2013 film The Wolverine, before becoming part of the main cast again in the 2014 release X-Men Days of Future Past and 2017's Logan. It isn't clear how Professor X was able to return to his normal body, as it had apparently been disintegrated by Jean Grey. No explanation is given either. He simply tells Wolverine that he too has gifts, but he doesn't reveal what happened between the films. How is this possible? As I told you a long time ago, you're not the only one with gifts. One of the defining aspects of the James Bond movies is that different actors have played 007 over the years. Of course, this tradition only arose because original actor Sean Connery left the franchise. When he departed following the release of You Only Live Twice in 1967, George Lazenby took on the role of the fictional spy in 1969's On Her Majesty's Secret Service. The latter film follows Bond as he tries to stop Blofeld from destroying the world's food supply. By the end of the movie, Bond has fallen in love with Contessa Teresa Tracy Di Vincenzo, portrayed by Diana Rigg. The two eventually marry, though the relationship is cut short when they're involved in a drive-by shooting at the hands of Blofeld and his henchwoman. Tracy is killed, and Bond is left devastated by the events. Producers were able to convince Connery to return for Diamonds Are Forever, and the opening scene shows Bond tracking down and killing who he believes to be the real Blofeld. Yet, no explanation is given as to why he is so determined to dispatch the villain, and Tracy isn't mentioned at any point in the film. In fact, there are some suggestions in the opening moments that Bond is actually pursuing Blofeld directly after the events of You Only Live Twice. 